Um, excited to wrap up our series on something new for Christmas as we get ready to celebrate Christmas tomorrow uh, with our, our families and loved ones. We've been talking through this series that Jesus is a gift to all humanity. And as a gift, he is, a, he is something new for humanity in, in a couple different ways. He is new in the sense that humanity never saw anyone like him before or since. He is God in the flesh, God in a bod so to speak. And that's who Jesus is, and no one else is like that. And so he's something brand new for humanity, but he's also something new in the sense that he's an improvement over or a fulfillment of some people who came before him. So when we look at leaders from the people of God from the Old Testament and how they led in some really positive ways, but they also kind of fell short or didn't complete their mission, Jesus comes along and he completes or fulfills Uh, the missions that were started by these people from uh, long ago. And so we talked about Jesus as the new Adam, the new Moses, and the new David. And today we're gonna wrap up with Jesus as the new Elisha. So as as we do that, we're we're gonna have to talk about um, miracles for a minute because Elisha's ministry was largely just performing miracles. If you haven't read about Elisha, did I say Elijah? So this is the confusing part. There's two different guys, Elijah and Elisha, and they knew each other. They, so Elijah came first, then Elisha. It's alphabetical if that helps, but it can be confusing. So um, I'll try to say the right name, but I might mess it up. Elisha was mostly a, a miracle guy, and so we've got to talk for a minute about miracles. I think most of us here can agree that there is a supernatural reality, right? There's something beyond just the physical world. If we think about it in terms of a box, we've got our box here and we've got the world inside the box. And so just imagine, I know some of you, my son is gonna be like, the whole universe, really, dad? Okay, the universe is inside the box and uh, God created the universe, right? So everything that is, is because God made it that's, that's where we sort of start as Christians. We believe that God created all that there is. So God is not in the box with the created world. He's outside the box, right? And so a miracle is whenever the supernatural, what's, what's not natural and inside the box, interacts with what's in the box. So when God interacts in the natural world, doing things that are not sort of following the laws of the natural world, that we call that a miracle, right? And so we, we get excited about uh, different things that we, we call, we use the word miracle sort of loosely sometimes. You go to the grocery store and, and, you're, and it's packed and you're, you're driving up and there's a spot right up front and you go, it's a miracle. Praise God, right? And so we use that word kind of lightly, but um, we also acknowledge that um, our faith is based on uh, at least one miracle. There's at least one miracle you gotta buy into if you're gonna be a Jesus follower and that is that Jesus rose from the dead. That's a pretty big one, right? And so we've, we've got to start there. Does God, who is outside the box, created everything in the box, does he interact with the things inside the box? And if he does, why does he do it? When he does it? For whom he does it? This is something we would all like to know the answers to. I, my guess is pretty much everybody in here has prayed for a miracle at some point, for someone to be healed, for some wrong to be righted, for some provision to show up when we're desperate in need. And my guess is that some of you have had those prayers answered, and some of you have had those prayers unanswered. And so we wonder, if God really does interact with the physical world, like what is the system? What is the strategy? How does he decide when and where and how and for whom? I hope you don't think I'm about to answer all of that because (laughs) I don't know the answers to a lot of that. But we're gonna dive into this and uh, look at the ministry of Elisha, who was a miracle guy, and uh, see how this uh, connects us to Jesus. It creates this longing for Jesus is what it does. Um, When uh, the the people of Israel remember these stories, we gotta remember that when Jesus comes along, everyone uh, in his culture grew up with these stories of Elisha, the miracle worker. And so they know these stories inside and out. And when Jesus comes along, it's really easy for them to make the connections. And so we'll, we'll track along with them. First off, Elisha was a prophet. 
And um, we, we know the word prophet. It's, there's a lot of prophets in the Bible and people who wrote books of prophecy. We think of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel maybe as some of the big ones. Well, those guys did a lot of talking and writing. And so we know a lot about what God was saying through them. That's what prophet really means is a spokesperson for someone else. So a prophet is somebody that speaks on behalf of another person. And uh, so we know a lot about some of those guys. Elisha didn't do a lot of speaking that we know of. We don't have any recorded sermons or messages that he gave. We don't have anything that he wrote down. His ministry was mainly miracles, but the miracles that he performed spoke. They were a message in and of themselves. And so what we wanna do is understand the message that's packed into the miracles of Elisha and how those same messages are in the miracles of Jesus as well. So first off, uh, Elisha, as we said, followed Elijah. And uh, Elijah was a great prophet before him. He did miracles himself. But when Elijah was getting ready to leave, which is all sort of mysterious the way that happened, you can look that up. But um, he, Elisha knew he was taking over for Elijah and he asked him for a double portion of his spirit. He said, I wanna be twice as spirit-filled as you. And Elijah said, all right, we'll see what we can do. And then when Elijah goes away in a, in a chariot of fire, then um, Elisha receives a double portion of the spirit that enabled Elijah to do the things that he did, which we know of as the spirit of God. So Elisha received double the spirit of God that Elijah had. And it's interesting when you track through their ministries, uh, Elijah performed, we can identify seven miracles that Elijah performed Elisha comes along after him with a double portion of his spirit. Guess how many miracles are recorded from him? 14, 14, pretty cool. So uh, this is where his power comes from. It's the spirit of God, the same God that Elijah served. And he begins to do things that just, there, it's, it's obvious that this is not stuff that happens in the box all by itself, but there's something from outside the box interacting with the world. And so in 2 Kings chapter four, uh, we read this story where there were a there were hundred people, there was a famine going on in the land. There were a hundred people that needed to be fed. And this guy shows up with 20 loaves of bread. And their loaves of bread weren't like our big loaves of bread that we have. They were small. It was about a single serving. That was a loaf of bread. And so somebody brings 20 loaves of bread for a hundred people. And, and he says, I can't put this in front of 100 people. It's not gonna go around. And Elisha says, go ahead and serve it. It'll be enough. And so they serve the 20 loaves of bread to 100 people. Everyone eats as much as they want and they have leftovers. That's a miracle. That's, that's something supernatural. That's something that's not possible inside the box, but is only possible when God interacts with the natural world. And it may remind you of something that Jesus did. There's another story. When a man uh, is a very, very powerful, a general in a foreign army gets leprosy and he has a servant girl who tells him, there's a prophet in Israel who can help you. And he's desperate because he's, th this is gonna ruin his life, this disease. And so he, he packs everything up. He goes to talk to Elisha and he says, I, I, I've heard that you can help me. Elisha says, well, God can heal you. Go in and dip in the Jordan River seven times. And there's a little concern about that plan, but he ends up doing it and he's healed and he, and he goes home well. A foreigner comes to Elisha and is healed from leprosy. And then, uh, and then we get to the raising of the dead. Uh, Elisha is, is, is gonna raise someone from the dead. And I, I think sometimes as you know, people familiar with a little bit the Bible, we kind of go, well, I'm, that sort of happened a lot in the Bible, didn't it? No, not really. There are three cases of people rising from the dead in the Old Testament, three. One was performed by Elijah and the other two are connected with Elisha. That's it. That's the only people who rose from the dead in the Old Testament. So Elijah raises somebody from the dead. Elisha is called uh, to this home where this, this boy has died, this boy that was beloved by his family and, and they waited a long time for him and then he dies. And Elisha comes along and raises him from the dead. And then we get one of the craziest two verses, little section in, in the Bible. This is, you can't make this stuff. This is so crazy. Okay, so 2 Kings 13, 21. This is at, right after Elisha died, we get this. Once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders, so they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. <laughs> I can't hardly read that without cracking up. What, what? They, and that's it, that's the end of the story, by the way. It doesn't go on and say anything after that. It's just like, 
They threw a dead body into Elisha's tomb and it came to life. So good luck figuring that out. But there was something about Elisha that um, carried this resurrection power. Now, resurrecting things, or people from the dead is not part of what's in the box. That, 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 we can't explain that. That doesn't happen just with the natural world. It's, it's gotta be the God who created the natural world interacting with the natural world. And so Elisha's ministry was uh, performing these miracles and these miracles were intended to speak something specific to the people. They were intended to speak to the people that God is present, God is powerful, and God is merciful. When Elisha shows up, amazing things happen, and the message is God is here, God is uh, able to interact with this world, this physical reality in amazing ways, and he cares about you. Elisha's miracles are revolving around helping people. And, And whenever he shows up and does this, He's communicating this message. He doesn't do preaching. He doesn't write, you know, prophecies down. He does these miracles, and what people are supposed to understand from these miracles is God is with you, he is powerful, and he is merciful. He he loves you. And so when Jesus comes along, and we get a chance to see um, how Jesus is gonna interact with people, People are gonna see Jesus do things and we're gonna see some of this and recognize it ourselves and they're gonna think of Elisha. They're, it's gonna bring Elisha to mind. Uh, one of the first things is um, there's a prophecy about, um, about Elijah, Elisha's predecessor from Malachi 4. Um, Malachi wrote, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So this was written hundreds of years after Elijah died, but hundreds of years before Jesus was born. So it's written in that time, Elijah's gone. But the prophet says, I'm gonna send Elijah. God says, I'm gonna send Elijah to prepare for the day of the Lord, for the Lord to come. And Jesus quotes that prophecy and says, this is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is Elijah. He's the one that the prophet spoke of and he came to prepare the way. So just like Elisha follows Elijah, Jesus follows John the Baptist. And so uh, we make that connection automatically. I like this little summary that this uh, scholar named Gary Schultz Jr. wrote. He says, like Elisha, Jesus is an itinerant miracle worker bringing life, blessing, and judgment through the power of the Holy Spirit to a people who had forgotten God. And so there's the similarities in their ministries are pretty easy to see. But then once Jesus starts doing miracles, it just becomes glaringly obvious Jesus is gonna do miracles for the same reason that Elisha does miracles, which is to give this message that God is present, he is powerful, and he's merciful. He cares about people. So uh, Jesus comes along, and we know the story of feeding the crowds. There are thousands of people gathered to hear Jesus speak, and they haven't eaten all day, and so Jesus tells his disciples, let's feed these folks. And they say, we got, we got five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus says, great, that, that'll do it. And so they, they start feeding the people with five loaves of bread and two fish and they eat until everyone is satisfied and they have enough left over. And the people who are experiencing this miracle as it's happening, they've gotta be remembering this, that Elisha did something very similar but on a much smaller scale. Jesus comes along and he does it like bigger and better in a dramatic way. And we know that Jesus also healed lepers. In fact, he even healed a leper who was a foreigner, a Samaritan leper comes to Jesus and is healed. And people hear this story, they've gotta be thinking about the time that Elisha the prophet healed a foreigner from leprosy. And then uh, raising the dead. And and I just, uh, I love Jesus' heart here for people. So uh, Jesus uh, comes up on a funeral at at one point in his um, journeys. Um, this is an awkward experience, by the way. We were in um, Vienna uh, visiting an old church a couple months ago, and um, I think it was in Vienna. And, and we, we walked in uh, to this old church, me and, and our guide, and, and, and no one followed us. And I thought, where's the rest of our crowd? Where is everyone? And uh, we get in there, and then the people start filing out, and at the head of the line of people coming out, uh, is a casket, and people are carrying a casket. I, we had walked in on a funeral. 
Um, and I didn't know. And so I'm backing into this you know, ancient wall trying to disappear because I'm, I'm standing right there as people are filing out and they're looking at me like, what is this guy doing in here? He's not our family. He's not even dressed up. It was super awkward, okay? So Jesus comes up on a funeral and I probably was different, but I know the feeling. And what he recognizes is that uh, there is a, a widow, a, a woman whose son has died and, um, and, and everyone is really sad. And so, uh, obviously, and so uh, Jesus walks up to the casket, the body, and he raises this young man to life. He, he brings him back to life. And here's how the people respond. When the people see this miracle, Jesus raising someone from the dead, here's how they respond. This is gonna be on the screen. If, if it's underlined, I invite you to read that aloud. They were filled with awe and praise God They said, God has come to help his people. I love that response. I love that that's recorded, is that this is, this is how people responded to Jesus raising someone from the dead. A great prophet is among us. Because we remember, we remember Elijah and Elisha as great prophets, and both of them raised someone from the dead. And so a great prophet is among us, and God has come to help his people. God is present God is powerful and God is merciful. God is willing to interact with the natural world in ways that help people. And so then we get to um, the, Jesus' birth. And this is the miracle that we celebrate is the virgin birth of Jesus. And Matthew uh, 1, the angel is talking to Joseph, who's gonna be the, the earthly father of Jesus and trying to convince him that everything is gonna be okay. This is a good thing and it's, it's gonna be for all people. And so uh, here's what the angel says to Joseph. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. God with us. This is the, the miracle of Jesus' birth comes with a message. And the message is, God is with you. God is present. God is powerful. And God cares about you. God is present. God is powerful. And God cares about you. That's the purpose of miracles. In fact, uh, John records this pretty specifically when uh, he's wrapping up his gospel. John writes a, a biography of Jesus' life. And towards the end, he writes this. Uh, John 20, 30. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John says, I, I could have filled many books with stories about the things that Jesus did, but I chose these specifically so that you would know that Jesus is the Son of God. And John records the, the feeding of the 5,000. John records Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And John says these messages, these miracles are messages that speak to you. That God is present, God is powerful, and God is merciful. And miracles still speak. This is a question that we need to wrestle with today. Do you believe that God continually interacts with the natural world. He, he hasn't stopped doing this. He steps in and he does things that don't follow the laws of nature. And these miracles still speak. And if we can learn to recognize them and see these miracles when they happen, we're gonna see God at work and our confidence in his presence and power and mercy is gonna increase, it's gonna grow. So the question, as we get ready to celebrate a big miracle, the virgin birth of Jesus is do we believe that God is still present and powerful and merciful and that he shows up and does miracles? <laughs> I appreciate the honesty, really. Like it's, <laughs> it's real. Some of you are thinking the same thing and just didn't say it. Here's the reality. I, I believe that most, if not all of you, have witnessed a miracle at some point. Whether you recognize it as such or not, I don't know. I, I could tell stories of 
people who have been healed in ways that doctors can't explain. I met a young man uh, just this week who was in a terrible car crash in April of this year. Um, He had 75 distinct injuries. The doctors told him that any three of those together should have killed him. He did lose his right leg, but otherwise he's healthy and joyful is the amazing thing because his interpretation of the fact that he's still alive is that it's a miracle and that God preserved his life for a reason. And so he's on a mission to tell everyone about Jesus who saved his life for a reason. I believe that you have experienced miracles as well. I believe that God continually interacts with. And here's the question that we bump up against that is is really difficult is, why doesn't everyone get healed? Why doesn't everyone who prays for healing get healed? Why, why, even in Jesus's ministry, he didn't heal all the people. He didn't raise all the dead. I I don't know the answer to that. I can tell you, based on what we know about of God's nature and character through scripture, that his, his goal is not to eliminate pain and suffering from human experience. That's not his goal. Pain and suffering are part of what it means to be human. In fact, Jesus, his own son, experienced pain and suffering and even death. So that's, that's not God's goal. That's not God's ideal for us here while we're you know, trapped in this physical, natural world. It's not to eliminate pain and suffering. But when he does show up, I believe it's intended to communicate to us that he is present, he is powerful, and he is merciful. And I think just like the people who heard these stories of Elisha, I mean, these Jewish boys and girls are growing up hearing stories about these prophets. For them, this was like their superheroes. I mean, I grew up with, I grew up with superheroes, the Transformers and G.I. Joe, and those were my heroes. And for them, their heroes were Elijah and Elisha. And they grew up hearing these stories, and it creates this longing for someone else to come along who can do the things that the prophets did. And so when we experience the miracles of God, I think we're supposed to have this anticipation, this longing for someone to come along who can, who can fix all the things, who can heal all the people, who can raise all the dead. And God has promised that Jesus is returning. And this, this is the excitement that should be building in us every day longer that we live as we're getting closer to the new creation. Here's how Revelation describes what's gonna happen when Jesus returns. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, he's present and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes for the old order of things has passed away. That day is coming. So just like we anticipate Christmas in this um, excitement for the birth of Jesus, this miracle of this baby who was born in Bethlehem, we are anticipating Jesus's return because that's the moment when all the sicknesses will be healed, when all the dead will be raised. That's the moment when this box that divides the natural from the supernatural just disappears and it all becomes one. That's the moment when we get to celebrate that God is present and powerful and merciful every moment of every breath that we take. This morning, as we prepare to leave, I just want to invite you to think about miracles. We're going to pray together. So would you go ahead and stand? If you believe that you have witnessed God breaking through into the physical world and doing something that cannot be explained by natural reasoning, then I want you to reflect on that, to remember that, bring that back up in your mind and ask yourself, does, does this increase my confidence that God is, is present and powerful and merciful? And if you don't think that you've ever experienced a miracle, I invite you to open your eyes, to just anticipate it, to ask yourself, do I believe that God can actually do this? Is this something that's part of my faith? Is I believe God does miracles still today? And be watching. And I don't think it'll be long before you recognize 
God is at work all the time in the world. He's changing people's hearts in ways that are miraculous. He's, he's restoring broken relationships in ways that are nothing short of miraculous. I believe, I believe true forgiveness is an absolute miracle when it happens. He's healing people in ways that are miraculous. He's protecting the church around the world in ways that are miraculous. And I think when we open our eyes, we'll see it. And I hope what it does for you is increases your confidence that God is here. Emmanuel, God with us. He's present. He's powerful. He's merciful, and Jesus is coming back to make all things new. Let's, let's go with that prayer to God this morning. Father, thank you again for Jesus. Thank you for showing up in our world in ways that are unmistakably you. And my prayer is this morning that our eyes would be open to that. It would be ironic for us if we celebrate a virgin birth and then walk away not believing in miracles. So just open our eyes up to the reality of who you are and what you do in the world. And as our confidence in you grows, God, may we just shine brighter. May we be bolder. May we be joyful in the way that we move towards Jesus-centered living so that other people around us can see who you really are and will be drawn to your son through us. Thank you for the birth of Jesus. We celebrate that today uh, just in gratitude and awe. In his name we pray, amen. amen. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, you're gonna get some festive music on the way out, so tune in for that. God bless you. You are sent to be salt and light in the world that desperately needs Christ.